Another topic assigned to me is a very difficult one, especially with the recent announcement of WHO on the MDR treatment regimen. So I will say that uh, this, some of the slides are still going to be fully elucidated when WHO comes out with a full statement in December. So my title of my talk is Multidrug Resistant TB, New Tools, Diagnostics, Treatment Regimens, and Innovations. This is my disclosure statement. I guess the most important part is I was involved in the delaminate study, trial 213, which is in press. So I'll give a little of the results, but I'm not allowed to give us the full data. And uh, as I said, I feel a little uh, uncomfortable with um, Professor Dean and Professor Lan here because Vietnam is really leading the way in looking for uh, tools and new diagnostics as well as new uh, weapons against MDRTD. This is the rank of uh, the different uh, hybrid and TB countries. If you will notice, uh, Vietnam, as I said, has actually dropped from the top 10 and it's number 13 in the ranks of the DSTB in terms of absolute numbers. The only reason because you have a very high population similar to the Philippines. And uh, I stand corrected at number 11 in NPR, but probably. This is another way of looking at this. The red reflects the Philippines and the blue reflects uh, Vietnam. And this one is from the recently released 2018 Global TV report. And I mentioned this before, there are still 13,000 uh, uh, people who die from tuberculosis. But the good thing is this, this graph of a very quick fall in deaths from uh, TB. The green is the incidence, sorry, it's false. The green is the incidence, which is also dropping. The notification is relatively flat, although it's still very good. And the incidence is of uh, HIV TB is actually dropping. And this one is a very good result of TB coverage in Vietnam, 81 versus Philippines is dropped to less than 60%, which is a major challenge. And uh, you have an estimated 5,000 MDR TB cases. I also read somewhere that the incidence of primary MDRTB in Vietnam is 4.1, and for those who previously treated uh, TB, 17.1. Uh, this is the statistics for the Philippines. As I said, we share in the fall in the deaths, but we are having problems in terms of coverage. I showed some of this earlier, and this is the data where Vietnam figures in the drug sensitive and is mentioned in the in the HIV, but uh, is actually at the uh, last of the list of uh, 30 countries. What is interesting now is the understanding that we shouldn't just look at TB, but also should associate it with other factors. And one of the great things in Vietnam is your very high social protection network. Your poverty is way way down. And you have a great population covered by social protection. You still have some out-of-pocket expenses there, and um, you still have some people with uh, who live in the poor areas. But I think one of the rising problems will. This one is an analysis from India in which, yes, you identify X number of patients, but as they are identified, enrolled, and dropped out of treatment, there is a great disparity in this system. There was a meta-analysis and systematic review of the use of some of the drugs that we use for MDR. This one actually mentions that the quinolones plays a major role in the armamentarium of uh, MDR. The other one mentions linesolid. This one mentions uh, uh, linesolid, and the other one mentions the quinolone. And the conclusions of that was that 
in individualized patient data, of observational data, there was improved MDR treatment success that was associated with the use of fluoroquinolones, rotionamide, and ethionamide. And what they were calling for more randomized trials. One thing that has caused a lot of uh, noise throughout the TV world is this recent communication coming from WHO. It's really a rapid communication whose details will be elucidated uh, come December and full document is uh, expected to come out uh, in early next year. But basically the good news about this is that you can actually treat MDRTB with just purely oral medicines without the injections. So this is actually one of the major I think breakthroughs that was actually greeted, but not all were actually uh, <coughs> saying because in the announcement they did not actually give a regimen. They only graded the regimen according to a group called A, B, or C, which I will show, I guess, in a more clear slide. A is the highest evidence that these drugs work either together or combined A plus B or C. Okay, so the highest evidence is the quinolones, which is either levofloxacin or moxy, plus uh, uh, bedaquilin, one of the newest drugs for MDR, and linezolid, which was shown in some of the meta-analyses. But you then add on usually clofazamine or cycloserine or teresidone. Now, as I said, I was involved in the laminin, but because the results are not officially out, for analysis, uh, once that is out, then the experts will discuss whether the laminate should move to the higher groups. But I will leave that to the experts because, as I said, I have a conflict of interest there. There is still a role for injectable in group C, which includes unfortunately expensive drugs like meropenem and amikacin. Okay, and we are talking here of the long regimen. Now, the ones that have been totally removed from the list of MDR is canamycin and caprio. And we run a very large PMDT MDR treatment center in my university in De La Salle. And we really can vouch that there's a lot of side effects coming from these injectables. In fact, one of the main reasons people drop out is because of the side effects from these injections. And of course, you have to monitor the QT and the, uh, the cardiac status of those under the neurons. Okay, the longer regimens of MDR can last as long as 18 to 20. Okay. And they actually mentioned that the role of the laminate will be stressed once the published work is done. Okay, and these are some of the drugs again in the different acronyms. So include all three regimens unless they cannot be used for group A, and then add the other regimens in group B, or you can also add complete the regimen the drugs belonging to group C. Okay. They also have a caveat that says that the safety and effectiveness of bedaquilin beyond six months was insufficient because many of the studies on bedaquilin actually only gave it for six months. So they cannot say if you extend how, how that will impact. And the optimal use of uh, linezolid has not been established. Again, most of the trials have been giving them for six months only. Now, there's a, a corollary instructions to programs to how they will be used, and I'm sure Vietnam also has uh, 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 issues here because in the Philippines we have stuck ourselves with a lot of capriomycin, and and uh, the stocks are still there. So, yeah, for a practical point of view from government, then we have to consume the stocks of the the canamycin and capriomycin. It's a waste of public uh, resources, but there is an instruction no longer to purchase that. But the biggest issue is the use of the nine-month Bangladesh Stream 1 protocol because a expert group, I would call them an expert group because I know some of the people who compose it, it's called the TBCAB or the TBTAG, welcomed the announcement because it actually veers towards a oral and we welcome that because if we're going to push MDR treatment to the community, it would be best that it's an all oral therapy because it's very hard to find someone to inject the medicines in the community. But 
they also had a comment, and this is the one highlighted in this uh, red circle. The new longer regimen should end the unnecessary and unethical subjugation of patients for avoidable disability pain and side effects associated with the injections. However, there are multiple challenges with the communication because they particularly point to the continued recommendation of the short regimen because the short regimen, the Bangladesh regimen, five of the seven in the Bangladesh are not in the group A and the group B regimen. So in effect, of the seven in the Bangladesh, only two are actually recommended in the announcement. So they are questioning why they continue to recommend the short regimen because they cite a study which uh, I think can, uh, can still be debated because stream 2 is still ongoing that uh, phase 3 randomized trial showed that the short regimen was not as good as the long regimen. Remember long regimen 18 to 20 months. Okay. Now having said that, I'll give you a little background of the, the, of the Bangladesh regimen and where it came from. Part of this comes from the studies, it's called a Regimen A and B, but just to point out, in the regimen of the Bangladesh, they actually use Clozaclozlofazimine, Etambutol, Moxifloxacin, Paracinamide, and then it is added on, supplemented by INH, Canamycin, and Proteonamide in the first 16 months. But note, only the one I underlined, Clofacimine and in fact Moxi are part of the announcement and many of these including canamycin has been dropped and the other drugs are either in category C or are not there. This is the point that they are raising. But looking back, there's actually a protocol that is looking at this for the stream study and uh, uh, it is still uh, being analyzed uh, because of course TB studies are long running studies. But these are some of the breakthrough studies that actually pushed for the Bangladesh regimen so that it was implemented across all countries, many countries in the world, I think almost 30% in the survey of the IUATLD. So this one, published in the International Journal of Infectious Disease, actually looked at a larger group in a high multi-drug resistant setting. This one looked at 500 consecutive patients um, um, done in Bangladesh and as I said these are the regimens that were involved note that the, mo the quinolone they actually used was not even moxi and ligofloxacin, it was gatifloxacin which in my country is also not available, so that's another one that has been a problem one of the things that have been uh, I guess questioned and I, this is my own personal opinion is the, the very very good success rates for MDR even in the Philippines, our success rates are only at a high 50s and 60s. In Vietnam, it's very good. I would like to praise the, I don't know what is your secret in Vietnam of how high the MDR treatment, but it's one of the highest in the world. But look at this Bangladesh regimen. It is actually 80% in any of the different variations of the nine month regimen, which is number six, uh, particularly number six and number one. Their success rates are, are at, at the 80s, okay? But again, um, some people have questioned how high and why it's so good and if it's replicable everywhere. So the question of whether the short course Bangladesh regimen should be continued is a question mark. We have our own experience in the LaSalle, but I think we should share it with the rest of our colleagues in the Philippines and maybe across the high burden countries with MDR treatment regimens to see if the implementation of the Bangladesh is really worth continuing uh, because uh, I would like to hear it from our colleagues here in the national program in Vietnam. Because in the early learning curve of the Bangladesh regimen in the Philippines, we had bad results in the first patients. Uh, but maybe there's other reasons. And I was telling you this that the Global Alliance is actually championing the use of four drugs Three of which, uh, uh, two of which are very new. Bedaquiline, tretonamide, and mixing it with moxifloxacin and pyrazinamide. For MDR, they are recommending it for six months. For DSTB, drug sensitivity, they would recommend it for two months. And this is an ongoing study. The Philippines, I think, is one of the sites 
of this, uh, this protocol. So we will meet, uh, I would like to just devote the last of my slides to our project, uh, which is the TDFIT, the Filipino Impact Testing. Again, this is a framework championed by the group of Bertie Squire and uh, Ivor Langley on looking at any diagnostic test, it should look at these different layers. Of course, we know effectiveness, okay? That's the classic way to look at it. But we should look at it at the level of the patients, the health system, how does it, uh, when we do a scale up, and in the future, what do we do if there are new technologies? And this is where our tool, because the only, the single test is not yet out. But what will it do if it replaces the gene expert? Uh, the LED microscopy is on the way out, in, even in the Philippines, because we're all going to gene expert, but very slowly, but it's in every province, but not yet in every community or in every major city. We are hoping that the Ultra and the Omni will contribute because it has a uh, uh, higher sensitivity for Ultra and the Omni results are also showing problems. We are actually implementing what we call a virtual implemental implementation model. It's only as good as the data we put in. So it has to be primary data that has been put in in order to make a prediction. The good thing about our model is we correctly predicted what happened. Our, our, our study started three years ago and almost at its end, the results of the actual survey of the Philippines actually validates what we saw. And so, as I said, I mentioned, we look at patient pathways, we look at sensitivity analysis, uh, adjust our assumptions in the census species and the other indications, and then make a prediction. So very quickly, we look at these following options. What if we just remain the same, smear what we have done before? That is uh, zero. What if we do expert everywhere, which is number number two? What if we combine X-ray with uh, gene expert, which is a variation of three, four, and five being the triage, which WHO is advocating? And what if we have the Omni? What if we have a total point of care very near the basic unit that we have in our countries? And so we actually did an analysis of this uh, and projected even the DADIS, which is a combination of death and disability. And we found out that number six is the best if it comes out, which is the only. It will be the more expensive one, but it will be greatest in averting disability and death. <coughs> in terms of making a diagnosis or in notifying cases, the, the blue ones are the bacteriologically confirmed cases. The yellow ones are the clinically diagnosed, of which I told you 50% are usually not correct in the diagnosis. If we employ the use of full expert, which is number two, number two, look at the drop in the yellow. So this is what is our current status in, in my province. If we actually fully employ expert, the traditional expert, not the ultra, look at how the yellow drops by two thirds. So it does not increase the number of cases we will notify, but it will increase the bacteriologically confirmed cases that will be correctly diagnosed. If we go to full OMI, there will no longer be any clinical diagnosis. And look at the increase in the correctly diagnosed cases that you will see. And its impact on health systems, it will actually cause more patient savings if we do the point of care because patients don't have to travel to the center, don't have to lose income because they have to have uh, treatment uh, uh, or prolong their treatment uh, while waiting. Uh, and this has actually been uh, applied in Brazil and South Africa by our colleagues. And this is how our model just looks like. We have an input, it's like a car with a dashboard. So it has input data on the different um, model, like the, if you do x-ray, if you do expert. Uh, we have different ways. Every time you click that, there's a number that comes out, which is like an Excel file. Then there's an output file 
for each of the towns that we looked at in the, the province of the media. And again, this is in, the, in terms of drug sensitivity, if you use the status quo, apply it to refund, uh, expert for all, Omni, what if you use XRS triage, which is why? This is how it impacts on MDR. The biggest impact of employing gene expert is the massive increase in the MDR cases that we will see. Unfortunately, it will also be more expensive for our programs because it's very expensive drugs. And this is the impact on the health systems. Again, uh, best results for Omni and next best is uh, Ultra for Omni. Again, uh, we have an ICER or incremental cost effectiveness. Number six will be the best. The next best is the one uh, behind this number, which is uh, ex uh, using expert, the ultra model. And this is how it was applied in one country in Tanzania. So what's next? May I end with my own personal opinion or else I will be shocked by my government. So this is my personal opinion as a student of DV for the last 30 years. What can we do for MDR? Maybe there's actually a vaccine study that just came out and will come out published in New England next month that looked at, at three African countries and the vaccine has an efficacy of 54%. It actually prevents active TB. They chose latent TB infection, about 3,000 subjects. So it's exciting. It has no name yet. But uh, that would be interesting. So, interesting enough, the study I'm citing is actually a study by Dr. Fox, Fox the meta-analysis on the use of decentralized uh, care for MDR. We are actually contributing to that with our study now, which is the, the big coach study um, trying to decentralize care. But in this meta-analysis, uh, again, one study is by Maricel Blair, who's actually active in our institution as well as in Makati. There is, uh, the evidence is still not strong. If you actually look at the summary of the evidence, it actually crosses one. So uh, the evidence is still not robust. It sounds very practical that if we move the treatment closer to home, then the default will be less. Compliance will improve, but it seems that the evidence in research is not that, that strong. Although the conclusions in this paper actually say that it is uh, encouraging here. The studies on health system in costs included in the survey, including resource poor and low middle income conclusion is that the decentralized care is cheaper or as cheap. And that it is something that uh, I think WHO has embraced. Uh, this is just part of our analysis of the survey. I think again, uh, Dr. Fox mentioned this. There was an analysis of how many patients are actually, 2.2% of the TB were seen in contacts of patients with active TB. And 0.5% of contacts had tuberculosis. And look, no cough was 14% in our survey, and only 30% at the typical cough of two weeks. So I think that adds to the evidence about the subclinical, although that's an ex exciting field to explore because there seems to be a lot of this. And uh, as I said, our government is pushing this. I was allowed to show this, but this is still a work in progress. It is not yet 100% implemented, but the reason why our NTP managers wanted to share is to get comments from colleagues in Vietnam whether this can actually also work uh, uh, similarly. So we're going to massively use X-ray where it's available. We will deploy the expert and we're emphasizing the identification of the risk, including the, this table I showed you a little while about concentrating on HIV, diabetes. We have 6% uh, prevalence of diabetes. We have a lot of people in dialysis. We have uh, cancer is number three now as a cause of death in the Philippines. And we have an increasing number of uh, patients on steroids. We have a growing elderly population. Uh, we have a survey of uh, TB in uh, inmates and in prisons. And surprisingly, it was not that high. And maybe it's because of what uh, has been mentioned. Maybe there was a clinical. Uh, maybe that's the reason it was so low. And uh, once they're identified, then this is the regimen and the clinical diagnosis. So, what can we do? As the primary pulmonary 
physicians of this country and in my country also, our role is actually to do a quality control of those who are clinically diagnosed. If x-ray is going to be used full blocks all over the world, we have found that the quality of the x-rays are issues in the remotest places of our country. The x-ray quality, they're not all digital. Some of the x-rays being used are very poor. And so that's the basis why many of the patients are not diagnosed correctly. We have a small study uh, called the expert panel study. And we find that gene expert will pick up 30% additional cases instead of using the smear. But if you use the expert, we're 30% usually also mistaken. So there's a changing landscape. Uh, we need more evidence-based recommendations. The new diagnostics will not work if uh, they won't be used by our people and if it's too costly. And these different different uh, categories need to be threshed out, particularly category two in WHO is no longer recommended in the Philippines and I think in many places. And uh, they're trying to introduce quinolones, but again, this is something of a debate. My last slide is an invitation. I know APSR is going to be hosted by Vietnam next year, but we are also hosting the Union Conference in the Asia Pacific region. Dr. Roa, uh, one of my mentors, and I am a local overall chair. So you're all welcome to come to Manila in, in March to look at this if you're interested in not just TB but other lung diseases. And we hope that if we are also partnering greatly with, a, uh, with EPSR, and uh, Vietnam is welcome to, as a uh, overall chair, maybe I can offer a free booth to advertise the APSR Vietnam next year. So just, uh, uh, I will go back and uh, promise to give you a slide there for free. Thank you very much.